You're listening to The Monday American, the show that puts the story back into history. History is all about discovering the why, and I think that in that process, it's important to never take the story out of history. Making history come alive, one episode at a time. The show made for the people, by the people. Dive into the Monday American. Don't worry, we'll be gentle. Welcome to part three of the Civil War series on the Monday American podcast. If you would like to visit the website, you can do so at themondayamerican.com. There you can find all our social media and uh, all the latest about what's going on. So if you listened to the last episode, you'll remember that I took a brief moment towards the end of that episode to essentially apologize to the listeners out there for the the tediousness of what I felt like the content at hand was creating. I definitely don't want that to come across in a way that makes it seem as though I think certain aspects of history aren't important or that they're worth skipping over entirely. I just want to clarify that my point was more so that up until this point in this story, the information has been sort of bland, I guess you could say. In saying that it's been bland is is not even all that fair. I mean, it's it's I'm saying it's bland because I'm I'm considering that it it leads to one of the worst wars our country will ever fight. And I happen to be one of those people who's incredibly fascinated by military history that's out there. And sometimes I get a bit lulled to sleep, if you will, by the setup of the main act, which is kind of what we're going through. Um, The reason I'm even bringing all this up again at all is because I'm super excited to go through this portion of the story, and I'm very much hoping that you enjoy it as much as I have enjoyed planning it out and researching it. Now, so far, this story has been fairly broad national information or kind uh, kind of formatted in sequestered events with several years spanning between them. Uh, that all serve as a big, deep background on the national front for where the whole issue began. Now, however, we get into the part of the story that is so fast-paced, it almost seems that if you blink, you'll miss an extremely crucial part of what happened. So we begin with the infamous rebellion of Nat Turner in 1831. Now, Nat Turner was a charismatic and an eloquent slave preacher with incredibly deep and incredibly religious and biblical convictions. Uh, So deep were his convictions that they led him to believe he was being spoken to by God directly. He heard voices, and he was sure that these were a sign from God that it was his duty to lead an uprising of slaves against their white owners. It was uh, very similar to John Brown's convictions, and uh, no doubt these two men shared their same convictions, and carried out pretty much the same general plan for a general slave insurrection in order to change the nation. Now, up until this point in the country, slaves rarely, if ever, rebelled or even attempted an escape against their owners. If they did and they were caught, or if they were unsuccessful uh, in an uprising, for example, it, it was an action that would be met with unspeakable consequence. Um, nationally, there were very few rebellions by slaves at all, There were a few, and among them, almost none were successful, and they were met with such harsh punishments, it it was enough to discourage any rebellious slaves from even considering an attempt of their own for, for quite some time. Among all the attempts of an uprising, the most successful of them by far was the uprising led by Nat Turner and his fanatical religious perceptions. In Southampton County in Virginia, he and his followers hatched their plan and began the uprising. They went throughout the town, the county, and they killed about 60 white men, uh, as well as women and children, and they ran amok, wreaking havoc all over before they were finally quelled and captured. Now, in retaliation for this, for this uprising, around 400 slaves in the area were killed. And this goes to show the fanatical foundations for both Turner and his followers in starting a murder spree, but also the slave owners in the area for disregarding human life. I mean, not to mention the fact, and I say this very, very cautiously, that the economic effects of killing 400 of their workers that they relied on 
for their own livelihood could have on them. It goes to show these fanaticism that they were all clinging to. Um, and that goes for either side, either side of the argument. They were willing to, uh, employ several different extremes in order to, to defend their side versus the other. Nat Turner issued a confession in which he stated, quote, a loud voice in the heavens said time was fast approaching when the first should be last and the last should be first. Now it's important to point out that such militant abolitionism, such as this behavior was a very small minority to the movement to abolish slavery as a whole. Now that said, the South saw this violent message and the militant actions of people like John Brown and Nat Turner, and they were so threatened by that message that they conflated them with anyone who was an anti-slavery advocate, which then amplified the impact of the abolitionists as a whole. It's not all that dissimilar to the metaphor of being unable to look away from a speeding train wreck. You know what the end result's going to be, and of course you don't want to see it happen, but you can't look away from the end result that everyone knows is well on its way, and that's, that's the path that the country was taking at this time. It should go without saying that slaves in the United States have become the focus of this setup for what's going to happen, and they become the focus in the U.S. for the next 30 years for any debate that anyone has, whether it's political or social. The next large argument that occurs in the story that drastically heats up the engine of total war was the issue of property in America and how slaves themselves were property of their owners, legally speaking, of course. When the expansion into the Western territories was heating up and gaining a, a large window of attention in the media and the national focus, it should come really as no surprise that the reason behind this growth of attention and discussion was ultimately due to slavery in the territories and not the territories themselves. The Southern method of slavery had formed an economic, social, legal system that found itself at odds with the Northern definition of property. We already mentioned in the last episode how the Missouri Compromise brought the issue into the national spotlight about allowing slavery into the new territories or not, and how close that instance was on its own to just starting a war, and it hadn't grown any less problematic then for the nation as it was at this current stage in the story. Southerners felt as though they would become second-class citizens in their own country unless they were allowed to carry their property of slaves with them wherever they went and saw that as a classic protection of rights of property that America had so famously championed. A perfect summation of how the Southerners felt about this issue is given by a delegate from Virginia who said, quote, We have no wish to propagate slavery, but every man at the South does wish to insist to enter the territories upon terms of perfect equality with the North. He may not exercise the right, but he will not give it up, because by surrendering surrendering it, pardon me, he should be acknowledging an inequality. In short, Southerners were boldly proclaiming they would never give up or relinquish their rights to govern themselves and to control their own property. In this case, the property they were referring to was slaves. Now, when you think of property um, in, in that way, or I mean, when you think of people as property, it, it it leads naturally to the progression of what happened next. And keep in mind, this was just the way that these Southern slave owners, it's just the way they thought back then. Now, and as difficult and divisive as the issue of slaves as property was, it, it really paled in comparison uh, as far as the story goes and, and its effect on the national the dichotomy that was forming. It pales in comparison to the event that followed it, and it it does follow the pattern of outdoing its predecessor in terms of divisiveness and fortifying both sides further into their own extremes. And this was the Fugitive Slave Act. And the Fugitive Slave Act was passed on September 18th of 1850 as part of the Compromise of 1850. And in the Compromise of 1850 was a grouping of a multiple various acts supposedly serving to tamp down the debate and calm both sides by acting as a compromise between the pro and anti-slavery groups. Uh, spoiler alert, it, it ended up making things much, much worse. The law required 
that all escaped slaves were, upon capture, to be returned to their masters, and that officials and citizens of free states were under the obligation to cooperate with this law. Abolitionists nicknamed it the Bloodhound Law for the dogs that were used to track down many of the runaway slaves. And if you've seen um, the Quentin Tarantino movie with Jamie Foxx, uh, Django Unchained, sorry, I couldn't think of the name of it. There's a scene in that movie where the dogs are chasing some escaped slaves up a tree, and that's how they ended up finding most of the escaped slaves. And as much as we like to think of dogs as calm, sweet pets, it was a terrible experience because dogs do what they do. They track and disarm their prey. So they named it the Bloodhound Law. It made the federal government responsible for the apprehension and return of runaway slaves, but it also forced northern residents on the pain of fine and imprisonment to not only allow, but to actively assist in this work. And if that wasn't enough, the law was retroactive in nature, meaning slaves who had escaped northward before 1850 and who may have been living as free people for years were to be apprehended and returned. It even threatened the liberty of thousands of free black men who were born free and may not have had a method to prove their own nativity in the United States as a freed black man. So needless to say, the law was attacked by the abolitionist movement from every single angle, and it often resulted in mob violence, such as the violent protests that occurred in New York, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Ohio, and several, several others. In 1854, one such episode occurred when a mass meeting was called in Boston to protest the arrest of Anthony Burns. Burns was a fugitive slave from the state of Virginia. The protest was organized by by a well-known abolitionist by the name of Theodore Parker. During the rally, the National Abolitionist Movement took an ever-important turn towards extremism in a way that those attending the rally surely didn't realize at the time, but looking back, it's clear that the point of violent protesting had completely eclipsed the nonviolent and would only grow in its strength, frequency, and popularity. Parker spoke to the crowd and issued his proclamation for violence when he boldly asserted, quote, I have heard hurrahs and cheers for liberty many times. I have not seen a great many deeds done for liberty. I ask you, are we to have deeds as well as words? I am a clergyman and a man of peace. I love peace. But there is a means and an end. Liberty is the end, and sometimes peace is not the means toward it. His speech so frenzied the crowd that they rose up and attacked the courthouse where the captured slave Anthony Burns was being held. In the process, they killed a policeman. Angry abolitionists like Parker, who openly admitted to hating not only the sin of slavery itself, but also the what what he what he called quote slave hunters, slave breeders, and slaveholders, had officially abandoned nonviolent protests from this point on. The result was significantly adding to the already fevered atmosphere of the 1850s. On the other hand, the most far-reaching response to the Fugitive Slave Act that was nonviolent came on June 15, 1851. The first installment of a serial novel was published. It was titled Uncle Tom's Cabin. And eventually the novel would grow so popular and become so widespread that it would sell more than 300,000 copies in the United States. And remember, in 1851, that's, that's the essential of today's bestseller. Um, it also got published separately in England, Scotland, France, and Germany. The author of the novel was Harriet Beecher Stowe, who said she wrote it to, quote, illustrate the cruelties of slavery. She was able to mount a relentless attack on the brutality and injustice of the institution of slavery and in turn further rallied the cry of the abolitionist movement. Needless to say, the atmosphere of the country was delicate at best. After John Brown's raid, political anarchy ruled and the notion of partisanship became a just a virtue of the past. With the increasing expansion westward and addition of new territories, to populate, the North and South again disagreed over a very key issue. This time, slavery was not at the root of the issue, and instead, it was the railroad. To simplify it in the most basic terms, 
the North wanted a northerly route and the South wanted a southerly route for the new railroad in the Nebraska Territory. In one of the most most bizarre debates in American political history to date, the nation received the Kansas-Nebraska Bill, which added to the national tension in a new way, universal and extreme distrust of politicians. So the bill nullified the old Missouri Compromise, which excluded slavery above the southern border of Missouri, then applied popular sovereignty to the unorganized territory of the Louisiana Purchase. And popular sovereignty is where the basically the residents of the territory would decide if it would become a slave or anti-slave status. And the bill divided the territory of Nebraska in half and renamed the southern portion Kansas. And it is impossible to overstate how much turmoil was created by this bill. The anti-slavery advocates saw it as a deep conspiracy within the government in order to undermine their movement. They saw the Fugitive Slave Act and then this bill abolishing the Missouri Compromise to keep slavery illegal being abolished as a governmental expansion of slavery and a threat to their movements and beliefs. Now, in reality, the abolitionists had misconstrued the events just as poorly as the Southern pro-slavery had been doing time and time before this. The reason for the result was the congressman named Stephen Douglas. He owned the land that the railroad would travel to if it was a southerly route and stood to gain, needless to say, a substantial amount of money um, if it went that way. And in order for that route to happen, he was able to come up with the terms that he genuinely thought would make both sides happy. Unfortunately, that just was not the case at all. Now, this idea of a slave power governmental conspiracy was not new, but no previous anti-slavery party had hammered at it so relentlessly as did the Republicans. Two days after Buchanan, President Buchanan delivered his inaugural address, which he condemned the agitation over slavery and ended up endorsing popular sovereignty in the territories, the Supreme Court of the United States ruled on probably the most famous, one of the most famous judicial rulings in history, and it became known as the Dred Scott case. Now, Dred Scott was a, he was described as a small, pleasant-looking Missouri slave. He had ended up suing for his freedom in federal courts more than 10 years earlier, following the death of his master. Scott insisted that by residing with his master in Illinois and Wisconsin, he had become a free man. Years of complex litigation that involved the widow of Scott's deceased master, the family of a former master, and Scott's wife, who also sued for her freedom, and anti-slavery attorneys who championed Scott finally landed his case in the high court in 1856. The nine justices, including seven Democrats, six of whom had decidedly pro-Southern leanings, decided that African Americans were not citizens and that Scott had no right even to sue in federal court. In the words of Chief Justice Roger Taney, himself a former slave owner from Maryland, blacks possessed, quote, no rights which the white man was bound to respect. In any event, went the majority decision, a temporary residence in non-slave territory did not bestow freedom or abrogate the rights of property. All of that might have passed with little public comment had not some members of the court also maintained that the Missouri Compromise and all such congressional efforts to restrict slavery geographically were unconstitutional. No citizen, with this line of reasoning, could be prohibited from carrying property, be it a slave or a mule, into the territories. So the Republicans reacted with charges of conspiracy and charged collusion between the court and the president, who had just in two days before... Uh, endorsed popular sovereignty and and basically promised that slavery issue would be speedily and finally settled. Uh, in all probability, no such collusion had occurred, but appearances counted more than established facts in the tumultuous 1850s. To Northerners, it appeared as though the tide of political corruption, which seemed everywhere so apparent, had now even tainted the Supreme Court. And certainly the court had emasculated Congress Uh, as the charge of the Republicans goes, and the oft-repeated warning of conspiracy seemed a step step closer to fulfillment. With their ability to halt the march of slavery by legal and constitutional means seemingly endangered, Republicans turned to moral outrage. The nation's flag suggested William Cullen Bryant, quote, should be dyed black and its device should be the whip and the fetter. (laughs) 
If slaves are recognized as property by the Constitution, no local or state law can either prevent property being held as such wherever its owner may choose to hold it. In his line of reasoning was that the nation should be prepared to witness slave auctions in Boston or slave ships being, quote, protected by the guns of United States frigates landing their cargo on Plymouth Rock. The best way to surmise these words and these fears is from a congressman from New York named William H. Seward, or Seward. Um, and in 1858, he warned that a collision was inevitable. He said, quote, It is an irrepressible conflict between opposing and enduring forces. And it means that the United States must and will, sooner or later, become either entirely a slaveholding nation or entirely a free labor nation. And that frightening phrase, irrepressible conflict, was what was entered into the forefront of American minds in that day. This is when Abraham Lincoln begins to make his political rise. He was another former Whig party turned Republican, and he really catapulted onto the national scene during the sectional exchanges of 1858 and 59. He had served in the Illinois legislature and in Congress before retiring from politics to establish what became a very lucrative law practice. And with a number of corporate clients, including the Illinois Central Railroad, he became a very respected member of the community, but remained politically ambitious and increasingly concerned about the expansion of slavery. The Kansas-Nebraska Act and the upstart Republican Party soon lured him back into the political arena. Uh, Campaigning for Fremont in 1856, Lincoln impressed party leaders with, with his style. And in 1858, speaking at an Illinois public Republican convention, he insisted that, quote, a house divided against itself cannot stand, words that have gone down in history. The government could not endure permanently half slave and half free is what Lincoln reasoned. And he said, quote, I do not expect the union to be dissolved. I do not expect the house to fall. But I do expect it will cease to be divided. It will become all one thing or all the other. He ended up speaking even more forcibly that summer when he challenged Stephen Douglas for his Senate seat. Uh, Lincoln called slavery, quote, a moral, a social, and a political wrong. Now, Douglas ended up winning that election, but Lincoln had made his mark as a rising star in the Republican Party. Still, no matter how heated the passions or heightened the rhetoric, politicians had managed since 1854 to disagree about slavery within the strictures of political convention and the laws of the land. And as the theme of the nation in the pre-Civil War years goes, that soon would change. And what ended up changing was John Brown and his merry band rode into Harper's Ferry. So I kind of did a Quentin Tarantino mentioning that first in the first episode or second episode, but talk of secession immediately gained new currency in the South. Even Southerners who were holding fast to the Union through the political upheaval of the 50s, they could foresee circumstances where separation might be the only guarantee for their security and prosperity. It was all the Democrats could talk about when they met at Charleston in South Carolina in April of 1860 to select their presidential candidate. Now, this election of 1860 is the election that Lincoln would eventually win is is probably it's hard to say if it's the most important because each seem thing, each thing, pardon me, seems more important than the last in this ongoing one up atmosphere of each event, it seems like. But this election was the absolute breaking point um, in the nation that brought total war to the doorstep. Now, as a South Carolina editor put it before the election, he said, quote, we do not care a fig about the convention or election of another president, as we are convinced that the safety of the South lies only outside the present union. And this we believe to be the judgment of a large majority of our people. Now, in fact, that wasn't the actual thinking of the large majority of the people, but it didn't matter because there was so much tumultuous rhetoric and so much divisive logic in the nation at this time. It was it was impossible to reach common ground and the extremes became the only two views possible. What ensued was a combustible combination of paranoia, 
fear and anger that was all simmering in the South during 1860. And there were still very raw memories of John Brown that made the white Southerners shudder at the very thought of a Lincoln victory. Now, the key takeaway here is that most of the Southerners did not wish to disrupt the Union, and few desired an independent Southern Republic, but they had become convinced that the region's dwindling political influence threatened to make them second-class citizens in the existing Union, and that a Republican victory would threaten their economy, their way of life, and their physical safety. They read reports that Lincoln's black Republicans meant to surround them with a cordon of free states, hem them in, uh, rejoicing in perfect liberty and growing prosperity. Once they controlled the national government, um, they assumed that slavery would gradually die out. And in Southern minds, danger lurked everywhere because all white people living in regions populated by slaves feared insurrections in which it was assumed white women would be raped and small children butchered. Now, even more importantly, slaveholders and non-slaveholders alike dreaded the collapse of a racial order that gave even the poorest white person some degree of social status. They feared the debasement of white society and the galling spectacle of black citizens claiming Republican equality with them. Some men even believed this northern challenge somehow threatened their freedom to control other parts of the world, uh, of, sorry, of their world, including their own families and their own hired workers. North and South voters realized that the stakes in this election were just enormously high. The entire future of the nation, politically, economically, socially, racially, that it all hung in the balance. More than 80% of the American electorate, the second highest percentage in history, went to the polls that November. Lincoln garnered less than 40% of the votes, but he and his party swept the North and won the election. Their strongest showing came in the upper tier of northern states where Republican the Republican anti-slavery message held its broadest appeal. Now, more remarkably, Lincoln won 50% of the vote in the lower portions of the north where Democrats had traditionally made strong showings. He racked up 180 electoral votes to a combined 123 for his opponents. And during the next three months, the slave states of the Deep South reacted to Lincoln's victory by seceding from the Union. The Fire Eaters, the most, the most dug-in pro-slavery advocates in the South, seemingly ignored 10 years earlier, finally triumphed. Secession, which had seemed unthinkable to most Americans, North or South, it gained favor because Southerners had lost faith in the political system. The new Western territories, which at first seemed like a blessing, had caused nothing but trouble. The root of that trouble was the issue of slavery expansion. Uh, beginning in 1848 as a question of political balance in Congress and conflicting definitions of property, the political debate had evolved by 1860 to become an issue of right versus wrong and a question of fundamental morality. It was too passionate an issue for an immature citizenry and a distended and shallow national political system to resolve amicably. Still, even at that, the triumph of the Republicans did not necessarily mean war, and the final steps toward that terrible event do require some explanation. The 12 months that followed Lincoln's election as president produced some of the most tumultuous times in American history. Within a single year, the nation was transformed from a unified, if troubled, union of states to two separate warring nations. Amateur armies and navies rushed to fight, the first shots were fired, and the first blood spilled. Civil war had come to America, and it gradually dawned on both Northerners and Southerners that had come for an extended stay. By the year's end, hopes that this would be a short and almost bloodless affair had quickly faded. The slaughter was just beginning. The presidential election of 1860 was a shock to the South. There were a lot of white Southerners that responded with fear and loathing, fear of the Republicans and loathing for what the Union had seemingly in their minds become. And probably the best way to put into words this fear that they had experienced was the words of a Western Alabama resident named Andrew Henry. And he said, quote, submit to be governed by a sectional party whose grand aim is not to raise the Negro, but to sink the Southern white men to an equality with the Negro. Submit to have our wives and daughters choose between death and satisfying the hellish lust of Negro. 
submit to have our children murdered, our dwellings burnt, and our country desolated. Far better 10,000 deaths than submission to the black Republicans. It's an argument in a frame of mind that is frankly just hard for people today to understand how people actually thought that way, but it was it was a very real fear to the people of this day. There was so much that rode on on slavery as an economic or as a means to their life, and it was so deeply ingrained in that culture that it became a reality for them. And while the examples varied, the horror story was always the same. Succumb to the black Republican plan to limit slavery and all whites would be impoverished, legally degraded, and worst of all, racially poisoned. White anxieties, anxieties, pardon me, I don't know how to speak tonight, I'm sorry. White anxieties about the emancipation had a decidedly gendered dimension. The black male slave, a docile and happy fellow, would become in freedom the, quote, buck negro a savage rapist who would destroy the virtue of all white women and children. This was just the way that people thought. Uh, One Tuscaloosa editor wrote, quote, It is considered heretical and unsafe to utter a sentiment in favor of reconciling our differences with the North, even were such a thing possible. In such an environment, with most dissenting voices muffled, South Carolina, this deceit, seceded, pardon me, seceded from the Union on December 20th, 1860, followed during the next six weeks by Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, and Texas. And this was the entire cotton South. So there is not a lot of weight in saying that cotton was the reason for the secession. Um, That's become a myth of, there's several myths of the Civil War that they had no choice, that they had to because of the crops, but I think I've done a decent job of supplying enough backstory for the notion of the cotton South seceding first to have some weight. They had the most riding on slavery as far as economic and, and just a means to just a means to a better life or a means to a livelihood, not even a better life. On February 4th of 1861, while the basically the phrase striking while the iron sizzled of the secession buzz delegates from these states gathered in Montgomery, Alabama. They drafted a constitution for the Confederate States of America and elected as president, the experienced Mississippi politician, Jefferson Davis, believing in conjunction with many in the North that Abraham Lincoln's election constituted an incipient revolution. The Confederates joined in a sectional coup d'etat. Abraham Lincoln would not be confederate or confederated, inaugurated until March 4th, 1861, nearly four months after his election. In the interim, President James Buchanan, um, a man of Southern principles and an especially weak lame duck, would be the one to face Southern secession. And in his clearest statement concerning the Confederate gauntlet, Buchanan argued that secession was illegal but that the national government had no right to coerce seceded states back into the Union. His stance nullified him and his administration as political or potential actors. In this vacuum, many politicians, especially older and more conservative ones from the border and upper southern Southern states, scrambled to create a compromise that would lead the Confederate states to return to the Union and prevent the other slave states, which were Arkansas, Delaware, Kentucky, Maryland, Missouri, and North Carolina, and Tennessee, um, and Virginia from leaving and vastly increasing the power of the rebel nation, especially Virginia. That was, I think that was still at this point, the wealthiest state in the entire country. All the various compromise proposals floated in these desperate months would have conceded a great deal to the South. The most fully developed of them was the Crittenden Compromise, named after its chief sponsor, Senator Crittenden from Kentucky. The compromise was an unamendable amendment that reaffirmed the 3630 line from the Missouri Compromise, banning slavery above it and allowing it below, Um, but it remained unclear whether the Confederates would consider uh, that, among other terms, sufficient to end their rebellion. On the other side of the political ledger, most Republicans were at best wary of any such concessions, and the more radical among them were hostile. On this issue, the president-elect, while explicitly refusing to make public statements before his inauguration, 
stood firm against accepting any proposals to extend slavery into even one inch of the territories. And Lincoln wrote to that regard to a different Republican congressman, uh, the words, quote, entertain no proposition for a compromise in regard to the extension of slavery. The instant you do that, they have us under again. All our labor is lost and sooner or later must be done over. Have none of it. The tug has to come and better now than later. He believed that if Republicans abandoned their steadfast conviction that slavery not spread into new lands, they would lose the reason for their existence and become just another political party incapable of halting the slave power. In many ways, Lincoln was a practical and conservative politician. He did in this way insist on a bottom line that he would not compromise. The secessionists were trying to win by threats and political extremism what they had lost at the ballot box. They had radically altered the normal political game, and so had Lincoln by refusing to back down, as had generations of northern politicians before him. And from that moment on, the middle ground was non-existent, and American politics permanently changed. Now, although several states had already seceded, the war had not started, shots had not been fired, on March, pardon me, good Lord, I'm so sorry that I don't know the English language anymore. On March 4th of 1861, Abraham Lincoln issued his first inaugural address. And in it, he was, he basically pledged that his government would not interfere with slavery where it existed. He included an offer to sponsor a constitutional amendment to that effect. And he promised to enforce the fugitive slave law. He also sought to assuage Southern fears by narrowing the issues at stake, um, discussing the fugitive slave law, which had led to so much passionate mutual recrimination and bloodshed. Lincoln said blandly, quote, there is some difference of opinion whether this clause should be enforced by national or by state authority, but surely that difference is not a very material one. He described the, divin the division by saying, quote, one section of our country believes slavery is right and ought to be extended, while the other believes it is wrong and ought not to be extended. This is the only substantial dispute. He downplayed the enormity of the sectional divide, and he appeared to be acting on his understanding of the obligations of his office and struggling personally with the implications of secession. He further argued that secession was the essence of anarchy, that the Union was a perpetual contract that could not be broken by the states, and that he would execute federal laws within all the states. He aimed this portion of his speech at the Republican listeners, who responded with gratitude for his nationalist firmness. At the same time, Lincoln promised not to, not to instigate bloodshed, although he did not indicate how he would enforce a law in a Confederate state by other means. Instead, he shifted the burden of future actions onto the South when he said, quote, in your hands, my dissatisfied fellow countrymen and not in mine is the momentous issue of civil war. The government will not assail you. You can have no conflict without being yourselves the aggressors. And in effect, Lincoln abdicated his executive power to the aggrieved portion of the citizenry. Now, this first inaugural address is somewhat contradictory in nature, but it makes a lot more sense when you keep in mind that it was a lawyer's attempt to calm the nation. Um, the new president appealed emotionally to a certain set of Southerners who he believed shared his love of the Union, but were temporarily silenced by the better organized pro-slave South. We are not enemies, but friends, Lincoln said. We must not be enemies. Though passion may have strained, it must not break our bonds of affection. The mystic cords of memory, stretching from every battlefield and patriot grave to every living heart and hearthstone all over this broad land, will yet swell the chorus of the Union, when again touched, as surely they will be, by the better angels of our nature. Facing the threatening unknown, the incomprehensible notion of actual civil war, Lincoln, along with many other northern politicians, expressed, expressed wishful thinking. He simply could not predict which way the remainder of the South would turn should some form of bloodshed occur, to which he would have to react. Nor did he know which way the anti-secessionists would turn should war begin. There are many indications, however, that out of almost wistful uh, 
op- optimism, Lincoln fundamentally misread such people as committed unionists when they were in fact conditional in their allegiance to the national state. That condition being Lincoln's refraining from protecting the Union by force against the South. Upon taking office, Lincoln faced a major problem left over from the Buchanan administration that went to the heart of the issue of potential war. And that issue was whether to resupply two forts off the southern coast. The more important of the two was Fort Sumter in Charleston Harbor at the very mouth of the hottest secessionist state. The Confederacy had ringed the harbor with cannons and had cut supplies off from the small Union garrison. Now, in order to not give emptiness to his inaugural inaugural address where he basically promised to um, carry out the the laws of the executive branch in all the states, whether they were Confederate or not, he would have to do something about Fort Sumter. However, he also said that he would not be the one to start war. And if he went to resupply that fort, it could be taken as an aggressive act of war. He was really in a tough place and right as he got into office. The decision he eventually reached was uh, basically an expedient of resupplying, but only with non-military goods, primarily food, and the Union fleet would sail into Charleston Harbor, but with an unwarlike intent. Now, Fort Sumter also weighed heavily on the mind of Confederate President Jefferson Davis. The Union's continued presence in the Charleston Harbor challenged the new nation's very legitimacy. In February, the Confederate Provisional Congress had recommended that all such forts, including Sumter, be attained quote, either by negotiation or force. Some Confederate leaders believed that a show of force in Charleston would convince the Upper South to join them. The longer, too, that the crisis lasted without a resolution, the more chance Southerners, even in the seceded Deep South, might have second thoughts, and Davis knew he had to act. And on April 9th, with the near-unanimous support of his cabinet, President of the Confederate States of America, Jefferson Davis, ordered Confederate Commander General Pierre Gustave Toutant Beauregard, in a very long French name for a southern state, to deliver an ultimatum to the fort's commander, Major Robert Anderson. Um, basically, the ultimatum was that he evacuate immediately. Anderson, who himself was a Kentucky slaveholder who wished to avoid war, agreed to surrender by noon on April 15th. He said, quote, should I not receive prior to that time controlling instructions from my government or additional supplies? And Beauregard knew that those additional supplies were already en route. And the early morning hours of April 12th, the Confederates began their bombardment of Fort Sumter. And after 34 hours, his garrison crumbling and his ammunition running out, his honor maintained and miraculously, none of his men were killed. Anderson surrendered. Now, if Lincoln had gained a bit of moral leverage from the Southern initiation of battle, he still had the fundamental problem of how to respond. But without hesitating, he called on the governors of all the states still in the Union to supply 75,000 militia troops for 90 days of service, quote, to favor, facilitate, and aid this effort to maintain the honor, the integrity, and the existence of our national union in the, perpetu- the perpetuity of popular government. And more specifically, to, quote, repossess the forts, places, and property which have been seized from the Union. This is when, a few days later, Lincoln proclaimed a naval blockade of southern ports. The assumption that such measures and such a relatively small body of men operating for such a short period of time could suppress the rebellion soon appeared extremely short-sighted. Also, if Lincoln believed that peace-loving Unionist Southerners would either sit on the sidelines or fight for the old flag, he was immediately proven wrong in four of the eight remaining slave states. What Lincoln had thought to be Southern Unionism had in fact been many citizens in the Upper South taking a wait-and-see attitude with a Southern bias. When Lincoln responded to the Confederate cannons, his call to arms liberated them from any remaining ambivalence concerning their essentially Southern loyalties. On April 17th, Virginia's convention, already in session, voted for secession. Arkansas, North Carolina, and Tennessee followed in short order. The significance of the secession of these four states cannot be overstated. More than half of the meager industrial resources of the new nation were located in Virginia and Tennessee. 
On the other hand, unionism remained powerful in regions with few slaves or free blacks, including the western portions of Virginia, the eastern portions of Tennessee, and the hill country of deep southern states such as Georgia and Alabama. In all these places, especially after the first enthusiasm for sticking with an abstraction called the South, wore off. Unionism would reemerge, and this would lead to guerrilla warfare against both Confederate neighbors and the Confederate army. Contrarily, Confederate sentiments would cause many Missourians and Kentuckians to fight their Unionist neighbors and Union soldiers holding their state. And this, br- this led to eventual guerrilla fighting that would become the most brutal and dehumanizing aspects of the entire Civil War. In the spring of 1861, however, few Americans had any idea how awful and gruesome this war would be, and they were ill-prepared to fight it. Putting great faith in their innate martial readiness, Americans always, always had been loathing to fund a large peacetime army. The military, with its inherent system of hierarchy and conformity, seemed contradictory to the ideals of the free and virtuous republic. Even the United States Military Academy at West Point had come under periodic attack as elitist. Wrapped up in northern and southern perceptions of sectionalism was a conviction that the South was somehow more martial and violent than the North. It seemed to many that the existence of slavery in the region's sparse frontier environment meant that southern white males learned early to defend their homes, honor, and property like like the Greek Spartans, living far from what they saw as the corrosive effects of urbanization and manufacturing, Southerners maintained that their rural-bred, hardy masculinity made them better soldiers. They also believed that northern men, particularly those from the industrializing northeast, were cowardly and lacking in values of patriotism, independence, and courage that was so vital to be a warrior. And these distorted perceptions helped to convince Americans that war was the only option that they faced. Lincoln's call for troops earlier in April 15th of 1861, it managed to unify both the North and the South. Um, The entire country teemed with excited young recruits rushing to join in the biggest adventure of their lives. Males of all ages felt the urge to go to war. Females of all ages felt the urge to go send their husbands, fathers, and sons to war. Men made bombastic speeches and dressed in colorful uniforms while the women stitched flags and lined small-town streets to cheer on their local troops. In the North, states competed to fill Lincoln's request for 75,000 volunteers, and they easily surpassed that number in just a few weeks. Harvard professor George Tickner recalled, quote, I never knew before what popular excitement can be. Holiday enthusiasm I have seen often enough, and anxious crowds I remember during the War of 1812, but never anything like this. Now, in the South, Lincoln's calls for troops unified them as well. Southern regiments formed rapidly and eagerly, and they named themselves things like Grayson's Daredevils and Montgomery Fencibles. They had an eclectic array of uniforms and bore weapons of all kinds. Women congregated in public halls, lecture rooms, and churches to sew uniforms and flags. Mothers, daughters, wives, sisters, they were all anxious to keep their new warriors well-fed and well-protected, They would hand out cakes, pies, slippers, and even umbrellas. This fervid martialism struck English journalist Edward Dicey when he was traveling in the North, and he wrote down, quote, I recollect a Northern lady telling me that till within a a year before war, she could not recall the name of a single person whom she had ever known in the army, and that now she had 60 friends and relatives who were serving in the war, and her case was by no means an uncommon one. And this was just at the beginning stage of the war. They were easily surpassing Lincoln's call. The South was getting numbers of volunteers that they never expected. Now, by the end of the war, more than three million people from all walks of life had served as a soldier in the Civil War on either side. With such an emphatic call to arms that the armies on both sides were experiencing, What actually made the men want to join any of the branches in the army has been a question that has absolutely perplexed historians for decades since. Most scholars agree that there were both ideological and practical reasons to go to war and that these reasons sometimes shifted and changed. The motivations that caused a man to join the military were not necessarily the same ones that kept him at the front fighting and enduring. 
This was especially true for the first wave of volunteers. These early volunteers enlisted because they felt a sense of duty and an obligation to serve. Others had a strong love of union, or in the case of the South, their state or the region. Um, in 1861, they weren't yet aware of the hardships they would face, and men were caught up in the emotion of the time and eagerly volunteered, worried that the war would end before they even made it to the front. Now, for sure, America's revolutionary heritage inspired men on both sides to fight. Southerners believed that they were following the example of the founding fathers and breaking free of a seeming tyranny. Northerners believed that they were protecting the union of states that those same founders sacrificed so much to create. Defense of home was a strong motivation for Confederates, especially since the Union armies were technically invading their new nation. Others joined because there was communal or peer pressure to do so, and staying behind would have been far too embarrassing to stand. You had to prove your, your own manhood, too, and that's one way to do it is joining the army and going to war. Now, very curiously, slavery, which was the underlying cause of the war, was not really the cause for which most Civil War soldiers volunteered to serve. To be sure, Confederate soldiers believed firmly that they had to protect their way of life and beat back hated Yankee aggression, but they seldom ever enlisted to defend slavery per se. And on a similar notion, Union white soldiers, especially in 1861, um, even though they were convinced that they were facing a slaveocracy that threatened their free labor economy, were none too keen on the notion of emancipation, let alone racial equality. There were true abolitionists in the ranks of the Union from the war start to end, but their number was always a minority, even when the war became one to end slavery. So again, just to clarify that it was not the, the abolitionist northern soldiers going to war to fix the racial inequality of the day. They, they were some of the most racist people, just like the Southerners were, they went to war for different reasons than the war was actually about and caused for. But for sure, these soldiers were, and really the nation as a whole, was not expecting the war to last very long at all. One young Tennessean named James Cooper remembered his enthusiasm and apprehension upon joining when he said, quote, I was tormented by feverish anxiety before I joined my regiment for fear the fighting would be over before I got into it. And it was not long before the very wishful thinking of most involved in this disaster was quickly turned into realizing the, the seriousness of the situation and that it, this war was not going to end quickly at all. Jefferson Davis was a West Point graduate and a veteran of the Mexican War. He looked to George Washington as his model strategist for the 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 strategist this I'm sorry the strategy of the entire Confederacy. He was convinced that the Confederacy just needed to hold out until a strategy of attrition wore down the Union armies. He believed that he had time, geography, and history on his side. The one thing he did not account for was that he had a political obstacle that Washington did not have. In a nation like his nation, the Confederate States of America, founded upon states' rights, Davis had to balance the needs of the varying 11 states in his Confederacy much, much more carefully than Washington had to do with his 13 colonies. In fact, Washington had given up a good deal of land in significant positions, including New York and the capital of Philadelphia, to the British. Davis could not consider such concessions at all, and he had to hold everything, although it became clear early on that he lacked the men and material to protect every part of his vast confederacy. It was an oversight that would end up costing him the war. But mid-June of 1861, this was far from the end of the war. In fact, it was about the very beginning of it. In, in that time, the Confederates had gathered about 32,000 soldiers split into groups of 22,000 under command of General Beauregard at Manassas Junction, which is a major railroad, um, 25 miles southwest of Washington, D.C., by the way. Joe Johnston was in the Shenandoah Valley with 10,000 Confederates near the town of Winchester. Rail lines linked these two armies by a few hours, and Davis, General or, um, Jefferson Davis proposed combining them by train to push back a federal advance against Manassas. 
The Union, meanwhile, had assembled 35,000 men under General McDowell in Virginia and another 18,000 under General Robert Patterson at Harper's Ferry. The Confederates expected McDowell's advance thanks to the intelligence gathered by two spies. Um, His intentions became clear on July 18th when Confederate troops under James Longstreet and Jubal Early encountered and pushed back McDowell's advance brigade at Blackbird's Ford. However, on the morning of Sunday, July 21st, 1861, real fighting began in what is known as the Battle of Bull Run. The battle would take place in and around the rolling farmland at Manassas Junction. Men in the ranks wore a variety of colors and styles of uniforms they couldn't even distinguish friend from foe. Several senior Confederate officers still were wearing their blue United States Army uniforms. Northerners and Southerners both were fumbling with their rifles. They strained to hear unfamiliar orders, and they tried to remain calm. Shot and shell tore through trees and bodies without any prejudice. The smoke grew thick, and the noise became deafening. Soldiers remember the very ground they were standing on shaking. And the air was hot and heavy with the putrid smell of carbon and death. For most men, actual combat was like nothing that they had ever anticipated and like nothing that they had ever experienced in their lives. Not only were men in the ranks caught off guard by the thunderous chaos of battle, neither army had provided them with adequate food or water, and medical facilities and personnel were nearly non-existent. It was as if no one had even foreseen that there would be wounded, let alone dead, after the two armies engaged in a large-scale conflict. To make matters worse, inaccurate maps caused the Union commander to miscalculate distances and the nature of the terrain. Among the masses of men caught in the battle's whirlwind of turmoil, violence, and death was Colonel Jackson, who by day's end, Colonel Jackson in the Confederacy, um, by the end of the day would earn a famous nickname. There are several different accounts of how this happened, but most historians agree that as Confederate General Bernard B. tried desperately to restore confidence in his broken command on the back slope of Henry's Hill, he spotted Colonel Jackson's brigade of Virginians, and he said, quote, Look, men, there stands Jackson like a stone wall. Rally behind the Virginians. Now, B. ended up dying shortly after he said that, but the legend of Stonewall Jackson was born. Civilians, oddly enough, were also swept into the melee, including a group of United States congressmen and senators and their wives who had come down from Washington to watch the Sunday battle. Arriving in fancy carriages and carrying picnic baskets and binoculars, they joined hundreds of other spectators, all assembling on a hill a few miles from the scene of slaughter. Uh, An English journalist who was there overheard a woman as she peered through her opera glasses, saying, quote, That is splendid. Oh my, is this not first rate? I guess we will be in Richmond by this time tomorrow. Some ventured closer to the fighting, including a Massachusetts congressman, who probably deserves this, but he was captured by Confederate soldiers. I don't know how you are able to not understand that as a government official of the opposing nation, you would you would not risk anything by going too close to the battle, but he probably wasn't a best congressman judged by that action. Now, the very idea that civilians for any reason would hover near battle underscores just how unprepared Americans were for the brutal and vicious war unfolding before them. Even Jefferson Davis was there. I mean, he came, uh, he rode onto the field on horseback uh, after hearing about the fight breaking out. He was pretty much anxious to resume his role as a military commander, uh, obviously ignoring the concerned pleas of several staff officers of his. He rushed into the fray on a horse. He encountered some shaken troops who were retreating, and he he excitingly said, quote, I am President Davis. Follow me back to the field. Until about 3 p.m. on July 21st, it did seem that the Battle of Bull Run would prove a decisive Union victory. McDowell's men managed to push back the rebels and take essential positions on high ground. But after Jackson's bold stand and a lull in the fighting, fresh Confederate reinforcements arrived to reverse the entire momentum of the battle the Union troops would soon be in full retreat. They were inexperienced and exhausted, scared and panic, 
they fled blindly and very unorganizingly towards Washington, D.C. A Washington, D.C. newspaper uh, correspondent, William Russell, he witnessed all of it, and he wrote down, quote, Infantry soldiers on mules and draft horses with the harness clinging to the heels as much frightened as their riders. Negro servants on their master's chargers. Ambulances crowded with unwounded soldiers. Wagons swarming with men who threw out the contents in the road to make room. Grinding through a shouting, screaming mass of men on foot who were literally yelling with rage at every halt and shrieking out, Here are the cavalry! Will you get on? The fleeing soldiers quickly mixed with the horrified spectators, which pretty much just added to all the chaos. The Battle of Bull Run, which was called the Battle of Manassas by the Confederates, it shocked the North. It was the bloodiest battle yet recorded in the entire Western Hemisphere. The Federals, the Unions, they lost just fewer than 3,000 dead, but the battle took a psychological toll far beyond the blood and pain. It refueled old stereotypes of a soft, impotent North and a robust, manly South. Soon after the battle, rumors spread of alleged rebel barbarity. Newspapers printed descriptions of Southern soldiers slashing the throats of Northern prisoners and using wounded Yankees for target practice. The New York Times, for example, declared, quote, The Southern character is infinitely boastful, vainglorious, full of dash, without endurance, treacherous, cunning, timid, and revengeful. For the Confederates, though, Bull Run affirmed their belief in their martial superiority over the Northerners. Their losses were about a thousand less than those suffered by the North, and their victory seemed to verify that the South had superior leaders and better soldiers. The Union loss curbed war euphoria in the North, as many people realized that this just wasn't going to be a romantic war that they thought it was. The day after that battle, Congress increased the call for Union volunteers to 500,000 men to serve for no more than three years, but no less than six months. Now, as well as strengthening the armies, the Confederates and Union were both undergoing a very serious effort to strengthen up their navies. And a lot of people who don't study the Civil War or aren't very familiar with it will either forget or kind of overlook the fact that both navies played a significant role throughout the war. In Kentucky, for example, the Federal Navy, the Union Navy, was positioning themselves to capture Kentucky's most valuable assets, which were its rivers. Union troops at Patica and Smithland already had a good grip on the lower Ohio River. Of more immediate concern for them was the Mississippi, the Cumberland, and the Tennessee Rivers that ultimately could provide Union armies with water highways deep into Confederate territory. The Mississippi River alone was Kentucky's western border and ran all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. The Cumberland River ran south through the state before going east towards Nashville, and the Tennessee River ran north through the state from Florence, Alabama, to enter the Ohio, <clears throat> pardon me, the Ohio River at Patica. One of the main goals of Union strategy in the West from late 1861 on would be to gain control of these and other rivers by capturing Confederate forts that guarded them and deploying heavily armed naval forces to patrol the waters. Their first targets in this campaign were Forts Henry and Donelson, and the task of capturing Fort Henry and Fort Donelson fell to 39-year-old General Ulysses S. Grant. Grant achieved a fairly easy victory against his first target, Fort Henry. Um, Both of them were earth fortifications, so they weren't in the water, like in a harbor or anything. They were constructed by slaves and soldiers, but Fort Henry was uncompleted and it was flooded in, when I say undermanned, Grant attacked it with 15,000 men. It was defended with a 100-man garrison. So when I say undermanned, it was sorely undermanned. And when they took Fort Henry, they had penetrated Confederate territory in a pretty dramatic fashion by securing that entire waterway. And one of the reasons the Navy played such a important part in for both sides in the war was because um, Ulysses S. Grant was accompanied by Flag Officer Andrew S. Foote. And on February 12th, Foote's boats, he had a flotilla that would go alongside Grant. And this was a fairly common strategy, especially for the Union, to take these forts. You would have an infantry force like 
Grant's force that was an, accompanied by a flotilla that would would team up and attack uh, the forts. So Foote went on a raid and his gunboats returned to Fort Henry on the 12th after Grant had taken it. And they both advanced eastward toward Fort Donelson. Um, his command, which had been reinforced to 27,000 men, marched 10 miles directly over land while Foote's gunboats went back north to the Ohio River and then entered the Cumberland um, River from there. Donelson presented a more formidable obstacle than Fort Henry. Its heavier guns completely mauled Foote's flotilla and 21,000 infantrymen, uh, most of them were sent from Bowling Green, um, easily repulsed Grant's initial ground assaults, which were decidedly more than 100 men from the previous attack. Then the weather turned bitterly cold. A blizzard swept over the region, and nighttime temperatures dropped to 10 degrees. Soldiers on both sides suffered, but especially the Union, because they had discarded their blankets and winter coats during a fair-weather march from Fort Henry. And on the third day of the siege, a surprise attack by the rebels opened a gaping hole in Grant's very thin five-mile-long line. General John B. Floyd was one of three generals defending that fort. He could have evacuated his garrison to Nashville, which was just 70 miles away, by exploiting that breakthrough in the lines. But the opportunity passed while he and his two senior officers, Generals Gideon Pillow and Simon Buckner, argued about it. When the Federals restored their line, the necessity of Confederate sender suddenly seemed imminent. Floyd, who had been one of the bickering subordinates in the um, in the ordeal, feared execution if captured, so they escaped to safety with a few thousand men across the Cumberland River um, on the only, av- only available river transports that there were, period. Colonel Nathan Bedford Forrest left, led the garrison's um, cavalry regiment to safety as well, and that left Buckner, a native Kentuckian and West Point graduate, to surrender the entire fort. Now, if Buckner expected generous terms from General Grant, who was an old army friend, Buckner would have been sorely disappointed because General Grant demanded an unconditional and immediate surrender. Newspapers later played on the initials of uh, his name, and they started to call General U.S. Grant unconditional surrender Grant. The Union victory, aside from that funny bit, stunned the Confederate nation, which had been victorious on most other fronts. Not only was all of Kentucky lost, but suddenly, too, western and central Tennessee lay exposed, and beyond that, the northern portions of Mississippi, Alabama, and Georgia. So to say that navies were important is an understatement of that magnitude. And this began to shatter the beliefs that the southern men were just too manly for the northern manufacturing men. And people began to realize at the end of 1861 that this was going to be a terrible, terrible war. As that year drew to a close, probably the best way to sum up the thoughts of the mood in the country and the people at that time was the words of George Templeton Strong, who was a New York diarist and lawyer. He reflected on the past 12 months that he had just seen, and he said, quote, Poor old 1861, just going. It has been a gloomy year of trouble and disaster. I should be glad of its departure, were it not that 1862 is likely to be no better. And he was right. The war had just begun. Its violence and destruction would continue for three more very long years. 